Yo, what's going on, America's History people? We have chapter 28 for you of the 8th edition. We are getting so much closer to the end. Only three chapters left, and you will know everything that is covered in this book. Before we begin, it's shout-out time. This is a special shout-out. I got a request to give a shout-out to Mr. Irish's class at Carroll High School in Texas, and I am honored beyond belief that people in Mr. Irish's class are actually watching my videos because he is an A-Push legend. He is the A-Push teacher that many other A-Push teachers look to for help and resources. So I cannot fathom that my videos are actually being watched by some of his students. So thank you. You have no idea how lucky you are to have him as a teacher. All right, let's get started with liberalism at high tide. Now we need to talk about the Great Society. I do have a video on this. Peep it in the description below. This is a focus on domestic programs including civil rights, poverty, and education under LBJ. It is building on the ideas and programs laid forth from the New Deal. I tell my students it's basically the New Deal plus civil rights. Now, before we get into detail on that, we're going to go back a little bit and talk about JFK's promise. Kennedy proposed health insurance for the elderly, anti-poverty tax cuts, and a civil rights bill. Unfortunately, he did not live to see that happen, but much of that comes to fruition under the Great Society. JFK helped demonstrate the power of image. It was very important in the election of 1960, which coincidentally, I have a video on as well. And LBJ became president on November 22nd, 1963, and he sought to end poverty because 20% of Americans were living in poverty, and it was even much higher for African Americans and Native Americans. The Economic Opportunity Act, which created Head Start, which provided free early childhood education for poor students, the Job Corps and Upward Bound provided training and employment, and the Volunteers in Service to America, or VISTA, or VISTA was a domestic peace corps. These were just some of the many initiatives under the Great Society. I love this picture of a Head Start program here. Here is Lady Bird Johnson, the First Lady, and look at this girl here. If she's not a future teacher in the making, I don't know who is. She's telling these guys, basically, knock it off, put that plane down, and listen. All right, the 1964 election got a video on this bad boy as well. as LBJ versus Barry Goldwater, who is very conserv conservative. It is a very liberal candidate and LBJ versus a very conservative candidate and Barry Goldwater. Goldwater opposed Great Society programs and he advocated a tougher Cold War stance. Ronald Reagan gave a very famous speech known as a time for choosing at the 1964 Republican National Convention. That could be a good document that you could see in the as an excerpt for a multiple choice question. The Great Society initiatives included the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, $1 billion in federal money for schools. And here he is signing it into law. And there is his kindergarten or first grade teacher, LBJ's teacher there. So if any of you ever become president, please bring your teacher back, bring your A-Push teacher back and um, sign the law next to them. You can bring me back too if you want. Medicare was health insurance for the elderly, and here is Harry S. Truman that he is signing it next to. Medicaid is health insurance for lower income individuals and families. And the Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, this was a newly created cabinet position that built public housing, especially in cities. The Immigration Act of 1965 reversed the discriminato discriminatory quota acts of the 1920s, and this allowed relatives of legal immigrants immigrants to be admitted regardless of any numerical limits the U.S. may have. And this especially favored Asian and Latin American immigrants. The Immigration Act of 1965 is specifically mentioned in the new curriculum. Definitely know that it is a reversal of those discriminatory quota acts of the 1920s. So let's talk about assessing the Great Society. Healthcare definitely increased for the poor and the elderly. The poverty rate for African Americans decreased and poverty and segregation, however, poverty and segregation remained in many areas, especially large cities. When we're talking about the rebirth of the women's movements, we have the emergence of labor feminists. And in the 1960s, women saw equal pay for equal work and maternity leave. And in 1963, we see the Equal Pay Act, which allowed for equal pay for equal work. And in the 1970s, more women worked outside the home than ever before. All right, Betty Friedan, definitely know this woman, very, very influential. She writes a book called The Feminine Mystique. And in this book, she argued that many housewives in suburbs were not happy and lived unfulfilled lives, that they wanted more from life than just to be housewives. The birth control pill was introduced in 1964, and this led to a the decline in birth rates and the end of the baby boom generation. That baby boom generation is that large birth of American babies 
from the end of World War II up until 1964. The National Organization for Women, or NOW, was modeled after the NAACP and it is a civil rights organization for women and it helped bring attention to lack of women in certain professions and politics. Kennedy did not want to lose credibility by withdrawing from Vietnam, so we're jumping to some foreign affairs right now. And think about this, it makes sense. Going back to Truman, when he was blamed for the fall of China, no president wanted to see another country term communist. So that is, Kennedy was very careful about this, as was Johnson. And we see that the war escalates under Johnson. He said a famous quote, I'm not going to be the president who saw Southeast Asia go the way China went. And in 1964, we have the Gulf of Tonkin incident in which August of that year, there was a report that a U.S. ship was attacked in international waters by the North Vietnamese. There's actually like two different reports that came in. And this gave LBJ a reason to escalate the war. So in response to the Gulf of Tonkin incident, Congress passes the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Star this circle out, underline it, highlight it, draw some bells, whistles, wherever you have to know to know this bad boy. Congress gave LBJ the ability to use any measures necessary in Vietnam. They basically gave Johnson a blank check and said, you can escalate this war as much as you want. And he does. This drastically increases the U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. Definitely know the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. That could be a great stimulus for a multiple choice question. Let's talk about a strategy in the Vietnam War, Operation Rolling Thunder, which was a bombing campaign against North Vietnam that began in 1965. And it was when U.S. planes would just literally bomb Vietnam incessantly. More bombs were dropped on Vietnam than in Europe and Asia combined during World War II. So this tiny little country of Vietnam had more bombs dropped on it than all of Europe and Asia during World War II. The North Vietnamese continued to resist and increase their morale. And Vietnam taught the U.S. that superior technology and weapons does not always win a war. It's a very important lesson from Vietnam. All right, public opinion in the war. There's emerging a credibility gap in which writers, journalists began to expose that the realities of the war were different than what the administration, LBJ's administration, portrayed. So what LBJ was saying versus what was really happening, there was a difference. So we see the rise of student movements and protests. Students for a Democratic Society, or SDS, they were founded in Michigan by students that sought social change. And they issued the Port Huron Statement, which criticized the gap between the rich and the poor, as well as the nation's consumer culture. We have the emergence of a new left, which is different than the old left, which was associated with communism. The new left focused on gay rights, gender issues, and abortion, as well as being anti-war. And at University of California at Berkeley, we have the free speech movement, which students sought to use universities and public spaces for protests and organizations, especially against the Vietnam War. In 1967, we have the end of automatic student deferments for the selective service or the draft and this led to an increase in protest basically it just because you were a college student did not mean that you could defer being drafted into the vietnam war all right young americans for freedom or the yaf was a conservative response to the new left they issued what was known as the, the Sharon Statement two years prior to the Port Huron Statement. This inspired many conservatives throughout the country. The counterculture, which is specifically mentioned in the new curriculum, they are basically hippies. And they were inspired by folk music and later the Beatles and Rolling Stones and other music of the 1960s. And they rejected many values of their parents' generation. They used many drugs, including marijuana and LSD or acid. And they helped introduce a sexual revolution into American society. So let's talk about the Tet Offensive. This is in 1968. This is a huge turning point in the war. And this happened on January 30th, 1968, the Vietnamese New Year. This was a surprise attack by North Vietnam on, on the South, or on South Vietnam. And although the North was defeated, it was a watershed event in the war. Watershed. Know that term, circle it right now, star, underline, highlight, whatever you have to do to know that. It means a huge turning point. You want to impress some AP readers? Use the term watershed. Now, many people in America began to see the war as unwinnable because for a long time, LBJ was saying the end is near. We're winning this war. Then you have this massive surprise attack by the North. And many people are like, you know what? That's not really what's happening. The war is unwinnable. And protests increased drastically, as you can see by one protest here. 1968 was known as the year of shocks because we have the Tet Offensive. You also have two key political assassinations. On April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated in Tennessee, and this led to riots in many cities throughout the country. 
And two months and one day later, RFK, Robert F. Kennedy, was killed in the midst of the Democratic primary. And he was running to be president in 1968 for the Democratic Party. So the Democratic Convention in 1968 saw lots of turmoil. Demonstrations outside the convention were broken up by police with clubs and tear gas and was broadcast on national TV. Richard Nixon gets the nomination for the Republicans, and he focused on northern working class workers and southern whites. And we begin to see a shift from southern whites to begin voting for Republicans. George Wallace was a third party candidate and he advocated law and order. He wanted to bomb Vietnam back into the Stone Age and he really wanted to crack down on protesters. He ran as a third party candidate, as I mentioned, also on a segregationist platform. And if you remember, he was the one who stood in front of the University of Alabama to try to prevent the desegregation of his alma mater. Nixon's strategy was known as the Southern Strategy, which sought to gain the support of whites in the South. And he was outspoken against, as the book mentions, the anti-war movement, urban riots, and protests. And you see here, he begins to win some Southern votes. And Wallace, a third-party candidate, won in these five states down here, effectively taking away votes from Humphrey, the Democratic candidate. And he really helps ensure that Nixon wins this election. And with the election in 1968, white Southerners began to abandon the Democratic Party. Please know that as an important turning point in political history. Focusing back home, we had the Chicano Moratorium Committee and Mexican Americans began protesting the Vietnam War as well. They argued that the draft hurt the poor and minorities. Women's liberation, feminists tended to be younger, educated, and associated with the civil rights and anti-war movement. So those two are closely linked, civil rights and anti-war movements. Some radical women sought to gain feminist goals through politics. And sexual politics advocated that women must have control over their bodies in order to shape their destinies. And we'll see that abortion is a very big topic during the 1960s and early 1970s. And they focus on access to abortion and awareness for sexual assault and sexual harassment. Title IX of 1972 is a huge law. And here is one of the writers of the law, co-sponsor of the law. Ban discrimination in higher education based on sex, and if discrimination did occur, federal funds would be cut off. This led to a huge increase in athletics for women in both high school and in colleges. Gloria Steinman, she helped create the National Women's Political Caucus, and she's also the stepmother of Christian Bale, one of my favorite actors. Where's Gloria? Does the Joker have her? That was my Batman impression was that good or no? Let me know in the comments. And she helped, and this organization helped sponsor legislation promoting equal rights. And in 1974, we have the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which allowed married women to get credit cards. And the majority was Nixon's belief that many Americans supported his beliefs in the Vietnam War. And let's talk about Nixon in Vietnam. He pledged to end the war with peace with honor. He sought to end the Vietnam War, but only in a way that was satisfactory to the U.S. and the U.S.'s image. So he proposed something known as Vietnamization. This is the gradual withdrawal of U.S. troops from Vietnam by replacing them with South Vietnamese troops. So bringing more Americans home and in turn replacing them with South Vietnamese troops. In April of 1970, the U.S. began bombing supply lines and bases in neighboring neutral country of Cambodia. Nixon did this and he are. And he did this stating that the North Vietnamese had supply lines in that country. This led to many protests on college campuses, most notably Kent State, in which you have the Kent State Massacre of May 4th. And if you go to Kent State, located not too far from Cleveland, you will see that there are memorials there for the massacres. The My Lai Massacre was a massacre by American soldiers of Vietnamese, mostly women and children, in which over 500 South Vietnamese women and children were massacred by U.S. troops. All right, detente, specifically mentioned in the new curriculum. This is the easing of Cold War tensions between the U.S. and Soviet Union. An example of this is the Strategic Arms Limit. Treaty or SALT 1, which was signed by Nixon and the leader of the Soviet Union, Leonid Brezhnev. And on February 21st, 1972, 10 years to the day before I was born, Nixon visits China. And there he is with Zhu and Lai. And Nixon sought to gain an advantage over the Soviet Union. And he also hoped that the Chinese would help end the Vietnam War. So in the election of 1972, 
Nixon campaigned on having peace at hand with Vietnam, and that, and that was a part of him winning the election. And in January 1973, we had the Paris Peace Accords, which ended the war. 58,000 plus Americans died and over 300,000 were wounded. So let's talk about the Supreme Court. The Warren Court is very, very important from 1954 to 1969. One of the first big cases they had was Brown versus Board of Education. They were accused of legislating from the bench. And what we see is the rights of the accused, the rights of, of accused criminals during this time increased drastically. You see this in Miranda versus Arizona. The Supreme Court says that people must be made aware of their rights to remain silent, which is guaranteed by the Fifth Amendment. And they also stated that sanctioned religious practice such as Bible reading in public schools were prohibited. Going back to Brown versus Board in the 1950s, schools were ordered to desegregate with all deliberate speed. However, 14 years later in 1968, one third of Southern blacks attended integrated schools. So most Southern blacks still did not attend desegregated schools. So busing became a major focus. And by the mid-1970s, 86% of Southern blacks attended integrated schools. Busing was used by the courts to decrease segregation in the South. However, in the North, the growth of suburbs helped increase segregation because many whites were fleeing the cities and moving to suburbs. All right, let's finish up with the 1972 election. You'll notice it's all red. That is for Nixon. Many Southern whites switched to the Republican Party, and Nixon ran against George McGovern, a Democrat from North Dakota. And as you can see, according to the map, Nixon won in a landslide. All right, we'll do a quick recap. Great Society, know everything about, specifically mentioned in the new curriculum, as is the Immigration Act of 1965. Know that it reversed those Immigration Quota Acts of the 1920s. Betty Friedan and now definitely know what they were all about, as well as the Gulf of Tonka Resolution, and that it allowed the president to escalate the war in Vietnam. Counterculture, a.k.a. hippies, are also mentioned in the new curriculum. Tet Offensive led to increase in domestic protests against the war. 1968 was a year of shocks, including the Tet Offensive, the assassinations of MLK, RFK, and also the Democratic Convention. Title IX increased funds for female sports in both high schools and colleges. Stonewall riots was the birth of the gay rights movement. Vietnamization is the replacing of American soldiers with South Vietnamese troops. And detente is easing of Cold War tensions between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And finally, the Warren Court know that it increased the rights of individuals and they were accused of legislating from the bench. All right, we look forward to seeing you right back here for Chapter 29. Thank you very much for watching. If you found this video helpful, please subscribe. Please share this with somebody. If you have not already, please hit that subscribe button. We only got three more chapters left. And check out other videos in the description, especially my brand new end of the year review specifically aligned to the new curriculum. Check it out. It will help you much, I promise. And I wish you nothing but the best of luck on all your exams, especially the one in May. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Thank you very much and have a good day.